Andrew Murtha, and I'm the director of the China program here at SAIS. Uh, it is my genuine pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. William Overholt. His, he is senior research fellow at the John F. Kennedy School of Government's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and in Innovation at Harvard. And he's also served as director of RAND Center for Asia Pacific Policy. Dr. Overholt has a distinguished history of analyzing Asia for both the public and private sectors. He has served as political advisor to several of Asia's major political figures and has done consulting projects for Korea Development Institute, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, the Philippine Department of Agrarian Reform, and Thailand's Ministry of Universities. He served as head of the Asia Policy Task Force for President Jimmy Carter uh, during the 1976 campaign. His consulting experience ranges from strategic planning to foreign affairs to the conference board, U.S. Army Strategic Studies Institute, the Foreign Service Institute, Dean Witter Reynolds, A.G. Becker and Company, Macmillan and Bloedel, the Honda Motor Company, Tongyang Securities, 13D Research, uh, and numerous other corporations. In addition to China's crisis of success, Dr. Overholt has written or edited America and Asia, The Coming Transformation of Asian Geopolitics, The Rise of China, which won the uh, Mainichi News Asian Affairs Research Center Special Book Prize, Political Risk, Strategic Planning and Forecasting, and Asia's Nuclear Future. In 1976, he founded the semi-annual Global Assessment with uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski and edited it until 1988. He's also spent 21 years running research teams for investment banks, including Nomura Securities, Bankers Trust, and Bank Boston, mostly in Hong Kong or Singapore. Prior to his banking career, he was at the Hudson Institute directing planning studies. I've written books that are shorter than this introduction, which just gives you an idea of how lucky we all are. Dr. Overholt's perspective on China is drawn from extensive on the ground experience, a willingness to dispense with artificial disciplinary boundaries, and an intellectual fearlessness that demands engagement and careful consideration. After Dr. Overholt's presentation, I will ask a few questions uh, and open up the floor for questions and comments. Uh, and then we'll have a reception at 6.30. Without any further ado then, it is my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Dr. William Overholt. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been quite a few years since I spoke at SAIS here. Uh, when I was in Hong Kong, I was occasionally invited up to the, the Nanjing Center, which is a, a wonderful pro program. I would certainly recommend that to uh, anybody who's, who's uh, uh, interested. I'm peddling a uh, a different way of thinking about China. It's a comparative perspective. China is the latest <clears throat> of a series of Asian miracle economies. Uh, and seeing it through the lens of the earlier Asian miracles often provides an entirely different perspective. Uh, if you if you only know one color, if you've only ever seen the color black, you don't really know the color black. If you know one country and focus on that, uh, you, you end up with a very different uh, view than if you put it in broader perspective. Uh, in the 1980s, I saw that Deng Xiaoping was just copying the lessons of his neighbors, uh, most notably, South Korea and Taiwan, and those were big successes. Uh, uh, the American ideology hated what Park Chung-hee and 
Jiang Jingguo were doing, but they were, they were huge successes, either, even if we hated the politics of it. And uh, so I ended up writing a book, uh, in, published in 93, after, after more than a decade of, of arguing about the prospects for China. And it was called The Rise of China, How Economic Reform is Creating a New Superpower. Uh, to say it was controversial at the time uh, would be a great understatement. The, the leading review in London said Mr. Overholt's bank must have paid him a huge amount of money to write such nonsense. Um, by the time Hu Jintao had been in, in power for a few years, I could see that there wasn't any emulation of the earlier uh, Asian miracles going on. Uh, Zhu Rongji was a world-class expert on the decisions that Pak Chung-hee had made uh, about economic reform. Uh, I don't think uh, Ho Jintao or Xi Jinping have paid any attention at all uh, to those things. So I wrote an article for Washington Quarterly called Reassessing China. And then a few years ago, it became clear that uh, even though China was on a different track, it faces similar problems to what the Asian miracle economies faced earlier, uh, what I call a crisis of success. And that's that's the title of my book. Uh, the Asian miracle economies developed from very special situations. Uh, they were all countries that were scared out of their wits. It was Japan after losing World War II, it was South Korea after the Korean War, it was Taiwan after the Guomindang lost the Chinese Civil War. Singapore after uh, a traumatic separation from Malaya. And it was China after a really bad hair century. What are the special circumstances that make these miracles possible? It's a simplicity of economics and a simplicity of politics. At the beginning, these were very simple economies. Landlords and peasants, uh, a few road builders, a few cheap socks manufacturers, uh, even a government can figure out what an economy like that needs to develop. Uh, similarly, on the side of politics, fear Overwhelming fear simplifies politics. Leaders who are afraid of social collapse know that they have to venture great things. They have to take great risks. Otherwise, the place is going to fall apart. They can't do incremental stuff. And a population of people who are afraid that their children are going to starve accepts a degree of social stress that is unthinkable in a normal society. Uh, so with the right circumstances, Leninist politics, with the right economic policies, Leninist politics works. Uh, I have a message for fearful Washington policymakers. Uh, this is a model that only works under very special circumstances. And the Chinese leaders understand that even if Washington politicians don't. China's early reformers took extraordinary risks to save their country. When the communists came to power, the principal lever of communist power was the rural communes. The communes <coughs> meant that the party had control over everybody's job, everybody's income, everybody's location, 
And they were even able to control who they married, what kind of clothes they wore, what kind of haircut they had. But in Anhui, some of the peasants started taking back the land. This was the, an unbelievably serious threat to communist power. But Deng Xiaoping looked at that and he said, the economy seems to grow pretty fast and, and the peasants seem much happier. Let's not only tolerate this, let's spread it everywhere. When we look at that, we look back at that through an economist's lens, it seems like the most obvious thing in the world to do. If you're Deng Xiaoping looking forward, it looks like the greatest risk he could take. He took it because the place was on the verge of collapse. And later, Zhu Rongji and Zhang Zemin did the same thing in urban industry. They stepped back. Originally, all the revenues of every company in China went straight to the government and the party. They stepped back with a responsibility system, said, well, let's hope if we put them on their own, uh, they'll make money and, and, and pay taxes. And, Maybe we'll survive financially. Uh, it worked. Uh, uh, this is what a vanguard party does. This is how a vanguard party uh, gets its legitimacy. I'm going to come back to that because it's the essence of communist success in the first three decades, and it's the essence of the political decay they're experiencing now. Um, oh, crisis of success. What's a crisis of success? Sounds like an oxymoron. Uh, think of an entrepreneur who invents a cool new widget. And this business, selling this widget, just takes off. And in the early stages, it's just the, entre the organization is just the entourage of that entrepreneur who's making all the decisions. And then things get complicated. You gotta raise capital. You gotta list on the stock exchange. You need real professional accounting and real professional human resources. And they need a board of directors and a public rule book and a whole organizational transformation that has to happen. And it, it, it's a, that complexity is a result of success. But the organization either makes it through that transformation or it doesn't. Call it an Elon Musk moment. Uh, and all these, all these Asian miracles get to their Elon Musk moment. For Taiwan and South Korea, it started in about 1979. All of a sudden, economics was more complicated. Politics was more complicated. In Taiwan, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's son, Chiang Jingguo, uh, was a tough Leninist, uh, much, much more ruthless as a security uh, guy than, than his counterparts in the mainland. And in the mainland, they, they put the dissidents in jail and let them rot. And, in Taiwan, send them out to Green Island and shoot them. But he was, he was close to his society. He got it, and he, he managed an incremental economic and political transformation that succeeded without any great upheaval. In South Korea, they had the same set of problems. Park Chung-hee, this kind of distant Japanese-trained general, didn't get it. He ended up getting shot by the, one of his good friends who was the second most powerful uh, person in, in his government. And uh, South Korea's transformation was, was much more difficult. So uh, leaders make a difference is the message in that contrast. Now, 
How has China's crisis of success emerged? Well, let's go back and start with Zhu Rongji. Uh, Zhu Rongji ran the economy from about 1994 to 2003. And he was a great market reformer. And in order to save the banks, he had to fix the state enterprises. And that meant giving 45 million industrial workers new jobs. Remember the trauma in this country when we lost 3 million, 3 million industrial jobs. We're, we're st still paying a price for that a few blocks from here. And he decided he needed to cut the Chinese government in half. Can you imagine Ronald Reagan standing up and saying, I'm going to cut the US government in half? Uh, the reaction would have been overwhelming. And it's a lot harder to cut the Chinese government in half. But at the top levels, Zhu Rongji pretty much did it. This was great for the economy, but it was terribly traumatic, stressful for Chinese society. By the time Zhu Rongji's term was almost up, when I was wandering around China in 2001 and 2002, people were expressing hatred for Zhu Rongji. At the beginning, they were afraid the whole financial system would, was going to collapse, and they knew he was saving them. At the end, it was, he's put us through all this, and he hasn't solved all of China's problems. What has he done to fix the rural areas problems? Uh, now, he's back to retroactively to being a hero, which is the right assessment. But at the time, people had had it. So the next guy who comes in, Hu Jintao, promised harmonious society. And harmonious society has deep philosophical roots. But at an operational level, it meant no more stressful Zhu Rongji reforms. And they, they um, ended up with a very sluggish government. Market reforms stopped. Uh, political reforms stopped. Uh, decisions were very slow. Uh, he had a Politburo standing committee that made decisions by majority vote. Nine guys. Now we have an institution of nine senior people who make decisions by majority vote. The Supreme Court, uh, very judicious, uh, but not very speedy. And in Hu Jintao's case, they'd make a decision, and the old guys, uh, Jiang Zemin and his, his uh, colleagues, would interfere and make it difficult to get any decisions. So. Uh, just a few years into Hu Jintao's era, people started saying, uh, we got a problem. We're, we're way behind the curve on market reform. And politically, things aren't working. Uh, demonstrations went from 20,000 a year to 180,000, and then they, they stopped publishing the statistics. There were these huge interest groups that were trying to get control of policy. Now, what do I mean by a huge interest group? Uh, one was called the petroleum faction. Uh, petroleum faction controlled the flow of energy through China. So there were hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of energy. And there was a market price and an official price. And they arbitraged those prices and put much of the difference in their pockets. Uh, they ended up with a lot of money. And it was run by Zhou Yang Kong, who was one of the nine members of the Politburo Standing Committee. And he was the security chief of all of China. Now, an interest group like that makes the NRA look like a puppy dog. China's interest groups are the size of European countries. And managing them is more difficult than managing the EU. 
it went deeper than that. The ministers were not listening to the policies of the prime minister. The provinces were doing things they weren't supposed to do. The military was doing all kinds of stuff it wasn't supposed to do. Um, and so the sense developed that we, we've got a crisis here. Uh, this is China's crisis of success. And they addressed it in a two-pronged way. On the economy, they got the World Bank uh, to work together with them to write a book called China 2030. Uh, they got American Nobel Prize winners like Mike Spence involved in the process. Uh, and they created what was probably the most carefully thought through economic reform plan in history. And uh, the overall theme was market allocation of resources, from which they derived about over 300 individual reform policies uh, uh, published in the third plane, by the third plenum and, uh, and Xi Jinping's first term. On the political side, is that things are getting out of control. We, we've got to centralize this. And so they, they went from a Politburo Standing Committee of, of nine guys, it's always guys, to seven guys. And they kicked out the ends of the political spectrum. Uh, no more Nancy Pelosi's and no more Mitch McConnell's. Uh, uh, Bo Xi Lai was put in jail and Wang Yang, who was too interested in democracy, got relegated to the second tier. They created a National Security Council for the first time to coordinate national security and foreign policy uh, and created all sorts of small leading groups that manage Taiwan policy and economic reform and military reform. Uh, and they put one guy in charge of all, all these. And uh, this, this new guy will get immediate control of the military, whereas uh, Hu Jintao had to wait two years. Um, these were consensus decisions. That's separate from the decision that Xi Jinping uh, would be the guy to get the job. And that is uh, important. So you have an economic reform policy and a political centralization policy. And it all seemed very clear. Uh, immediately the problems began. If the market's allocating resources then government groups and party groups are not allocating resources. So they're unhappy. If the market is allocating resources and the state enterprises are being put on a market basis, and as Nick Lardy has taught us, uh, the state enterprises can't earn back their cost of capital. Uh, they only can pay back the banks through their special privileges. So not only are state enterprises unhappy, but the banks get unhappy. The worst squeeze is on local governments. Uh, terrible financial problems. Uh, I, I tempted to take five minutes and describe just how horrendous those are, but uh, if, if somebody wants me to elaborate later, I will. And, uh, they were reforming the military, so the military uh, also unhappy. Now, uh, that means the reforms that were supposed to occur were destined to step on the toes of every power group on China. Now, if you're the leader of an organization and every group under you is unhappy, that's the most dangerous situation you can put yourself in. Uh, comparable cases, uh, Shah of Iran in 1977, uh, uh, the Polish government in 1980. Uh, smart reformers tend to be like Ataturk or you in, in old Turkey. You, you get a coalition together and reform that group, and then you 
get another <coughs> coalition together and reform that group. But China's trying to do it all at the same time. Oh, big problem. But Xi Jinping had a very powerful lever for dealing with folks who got in his way, the anti-corruption campaign. And so who was the first big target of the anti-corruption campaign? Zhou Yang Kang, head of the petroleum faction. And then he went after several leading generals. Uh, and so anybody who got in his way got kicked aside. But again, he's taking on every power group in society at the same time because the anti-corruption campaign was applied to everybody. So now you've doubled down on alienating all the, all the power groups. And there was a second problem that occurred. If I'm a reformer and you're what I'm supposed to reform, you're going to be unhappy. So what are you going to say? You're going to say, and I'm corrupt. And I probably am. So I feel very vulnerable. So instead of being a vigorous reformer, I'm going to kind of hide under the desk and hope nobody notices me. So reform was going nowhere fast. Um, in this situation, things got very rough. When Xi Jinping came to power, he thought there was a, a coup plot underway. Uh, not long after he came to power, one of China's most successful executives visited me at Harvard and he said, Bill, the atmosphere in Beijing is you die or I die. Now, what we see on our, t our TV screens and what our media and our politicians tend to react to is this image of this leader looks kind of charismatic, every hair is in place, uh, all the bureaucrats are lined up behind with same black suit, same white shirt, same red tie, uh, same black hair. Everything, everything is perfect, except that that's not the reality. Uh, it's been a very rough time. So the decision was the first term of five years has to be consolidating power, getting rid of all these opponents. And Xi Jinping did a fantastic job of that. He's really good at, at getting rid of, of rivals. Um, then the second year, uh, second year is supposed to, the second term is supposed to be for reform. And we're about one, one year into that term now. Uh, and but then they got to thinking, you know, since these reforms that are supposed to happen are creating so many enemies, uh, we need to worry about what happens after Xi Jinping's term. Uh, maybe the next guy is going to do to Xi Jinping what Trump is doing to Obama just try to get, negate everything. And maybe it could be worse than that. Maybe there could be very serious reprisals. Maybe somebody would want to do to some of Xi Jinping's people what Xi Jinping has done to Bo Xilai. So better allow for the possibility of a third term. Okay, how is reform going? In every area where the government has faced a fundamental choice, are we going to have our cake or are we going to eat it? The answer has been, we're going to have our cake and we're going to eat it. So they had a choice. Uh, we can have fast reform and slow growth, or we can have fast growth and slow reform. But the policy is we're going to have fast growth and fast reform. 
uh, we're going to have market allocation of resources, but the core of policy is $1.7 trillion of subsidies to a bunch of big state enterprises. We're going to have the rule of law, but we're going to strengthen the party commission that tells the judges what to decide. We're going to marketize the state enterprises, but there's going to be a more powerful party committee inside every enterprise, not just state enterprise, also private enterprises, that's going to have a new degree of control over strategic business decisions. And uh, the party committees, at least in Beijing, are taking control over strategic business decisions. Um, so is this like Mao Zedong or Deng Xiaoping? That's more like Britain's Theresa May. We're going to have Brexit and we're going to have this great, prosperous economy. Um, it's, it's a kind of strategic indecision. But the indecision is not completely indecisive. Wherever there's a choice between economic reform and political control, the choice is consistently political control. So under Mao, the priority was politics and command. Under Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin, the policy was economics in command. Under Xi Jinping, it's politics mostly in command. That leads me to some thoughts about the, the role of Xi Jinping. We're told that he's the omnipotent leader for life and control of everything. We're told that he is, he is to China as Putin is to Russia. This is just about 170 degrees wrong. Uh, first of all, the most, uh, Xi Jinping is very powerful. He's got a list of titles that takes a full page. Uh, he's gotten rid of his adversaries. Uh, he's written into the Constitution. Uh, he's even got a series of speeches and movies that say that he and his father are responsible for uh, China's reform and its successes uh, since, since uh, uh, 1979. Not so, not so much Deng Xiaoping. Everybody's afraid. Nobody's going to challenge him. But the ultimate test of a leader is... Can he implement his policies? And the record so far is that there's been, except for military reform, very little of the kind of, of forward movement on economic uh, reform that we expected from earlier leaders. Is he... <coughs> The Putin of China, we're always told to bracket these two together. Well, Xi Jinping is a creature of the Communist Party of China. He's an executive given a job to do, and he's accountable. Putin's party is a creature of Putin. It exists solely to make Putin more powerful and richer. Uh, the, the difference is absolute, and the, the difference is entirely in China's favor. But it puts a whole different perspective on Xi Jinping when you realize the difference. The sober reality is that Xi Jinping has a job to do, and he's not doing that job. He's not reforming the economy. The consequences take a long time to ramify. If you look at what happens in business, Jeff Immelt ran GE and ran it into the ground. It took 18 years. China's a lot more complicated than GE. 
so you won't see uh, consequences for a long time. A competent, confident CEO does not take charge of, of every area of po policy. If you think of a big company, imagine the CEO making himself or herself director of every operating division in the company. Does that show competence? Does it show confidence? No, this is, it creates a situation where most decisions are made too slowly. And in a crisis like the stock market collapse in 2015, they're made too fast because they made by one person. What's happening on the political side is uh, a, a gradual shift of, of attitudes. If you look at the professional community, uh, journalists, academics, lawyers, the, the, the leading edge of a modern society, they have all gone from very positive uh, to very negative. Uh, five years ago, China was one of the few places in the developing world where most academics supported the government. Uh, to, well, there, there's some repression that we wish weren't there. But look at what this party has done for the country. It's done incredible things for the people of the country. We support it. No more. Uh, the business community is particularly important. Uh, uh, state enterprise executives have lost about half their pay. They're, they're not happy about that. But what's really important is the private sector. And what's happening to the private sector is it's getting squeezed financially. And as, it, as the private companies become vulnerable, the, the state enterprises gobble them up. Uh, but put yourself in the position of some guy who some woman who's built a, a local business. And even though private business in China is nothing like what we think of as private business. It all, all hangs from the political system in one way or another. But people throw their lives into building these businesses. And then the, the party secretary, who's the legitimate arbiter of social justice, calls up and says, uh, I've got a new project downtown. Uh, it's, it's good for our city. Uh, I need a million dollars contribution by next Tuesday. And if I don't get it, you're shut down. But he doesn't have to say that, that part because it, it's, it's happened enough times that it doesn't have to be said. In the new situation where the, the government is trying to deleverage, there are going to be three projects downtown. And the, the resentment builds up. Uh, and so you, you see it's a very gradual process. But the support base is evolving in a, in a very negative way. Um, I want to make two balancing semi-contradictory points. One is that this uh, crisis of political success is inexorable. Uh, these interest groups, the support of the vanguard parts of modern society, insist on being heard. Uh, uh, what, what you have when the, the politics is to sit on the lid of the boiling kettle, you have to keep adding weight on the lid of the boiling kettle. So you get repression, and then you get pushback, and then you get more repression and more pushback, and it becomes a vicious circle. Uh, and 
there is no political strategy that's the counterpart of the economic strategy. The problem is the same. How do you deal with complexity? On the economic side, you let the market make a lot of the decisions. The NDRC doesn't have to make all the decisions. On the political side, it's just we're going to sit on the lid of the boiling kettle. It doesn't mean they have to move to our kind of democracy. But there has to be some way of making relatively automatic, legitimate decisions. Uh, and, and the Central Party School and academics and even very senior officials from China have thought about these things and are very t articulate. Actually, under Hu Jintao, when he was head of the party school, uh, they did very sophisticated thinking about these issues. But that's all been put in a file cabinet somewhere. So they've got a problem. It's a very serious problem. On the other hand, does this mean that they're vulnerable to some kind of great revolution? And my answer is absolutely not. Uh, I spent a whole core of this book looking at the great social issues. Now, in order to see those clearly, you have to throw out an awful lot of Western social science. Uh, there's an awful lot of ideology and methodological nonsense that's built into uh, so much of what, what we're told. Uh, start with a simple one, the environment. For many years, we were taught that this nefarious communist system was uniquely awful on environmental issues. It was just obsessed with economic growth to the exclusion of everything else. And other systems, especially democracies, implicitly aren't like that. Well, even at the time this stuff was being written, the effect of air quality on human health was 11 times worse in India. And Chinese cities don't even make the top 100 of the worst polluted major cities of the world. And now what we're seeing, every country goes, every successful society reaches a certain threshold. London got there in 1950. 2,000 people died overnight from coal pollution in the air. Coated their lungs and they just died. They couldn't get any oxygen. And the British said, we better clean this up. Japan got there in 1970. Great, four great environmental scandals. We got there in 1970. They had a river in Ohio that kept catching fire and Rachel Carson pulled it together in her book, The Silent Spring. Well, China got there half a dozen years ago, and now they are, they are spending more on environmental uh, amelioration than the United States is, more than all of Europe. They're digging out a very deep, deep hole, but they're, they're digging harder than anybody else. And they're the leader in every form of green, green energy and in electric cars. You name it, they're, they're leading the world. Uh, uh, so that, that was a kind of phony uh, sociological political analysis. And take, take our economic view. The leading development of our development economists of our day are Asimoglu of MIT and Robinson, my colleague at Harvard. And they have shown very persuasively, if you want to sustain economic growth for a long period of time, you need an inclusive economy. Everybody's got to have a piece of the action, or most people. And they, they're always making derogatory marks about China because it's not politically inclusive. And we Americans think that economic inclusiveness and political inclusiveness go together. In fact, at this level of de development, they go in absolutely opposite directions. So let me tell you how an Asian miracle economy creates an inclusive society. You start by taking the basic asset of a peasant society, which is land. 
and you do a land reform. Everybody gets a piece. And then you give everybody a basic education. This is something that Korea has done, Taiwan has done, Singapore has done, China has done, India can't do it. In India, about a third of the population, about half women are illiterate. And, and then you build world-class infrastructure and you attract labor-intensive industry. Labor-intensive industry. Once the benefits of all this great education and good roads and good railroads and good ports and good telecommunications, uh, every textile producer and electronics assembler in the world wants to go to these places. Originally Japan, and then it was Taiwan, and South Korea, and Singapore, and used to be China. Now they're all headed other places. Uh, everybody gets a job in the modern world, eventually. And the biggest beneficiaries, women. In almost all traditional agricultural societies, the margin of survival or not is muscles. And the average guy has a little more muscle than the average woman, so they all want boys. If you go to China today, you go to a textile factory, you go to an Apple factory, you go to a gigabyte computer factory, you got 11 Taiwanese guys running the place and 8,000 Chinese women. Now, it's still unfair that it's 11 Taiwanese guys running the place. But these women go 500 miles, 1,000 miles, 1,500 miles to get these jobs. It gets them out from under the thumbs of their fathers and their brothers. They all say that's the big benefit. And then they're the ones who learn how a modern world works. And they're the ones who make a little nest egg so that if they go back to the village, they have the down payment on the house, and on the home. <coughs> There's still a lot of unfair things going in, in Chinese gender issues. And Lita Hong Fincher uh, writes very well about some of these. But if you want one index of how things have changed, in the old days, a woman had to bring a dowry. Today, the guy better bring an apartment. She will not date you if you can't offer an apartment. <coughs> That's a male dowry. So huge change. And then you give everybody a home. China has the highest rate of home ownership in the world, except for Singapore. China's about 85%. We're about 64%. Singapore's 90%. And then all these countries have a massive property price inflation. In Japan, it happened in the 80s. It happened a little later in South Korea and Taiwan. And we're just, it's just plateauing in China now. So this home, however humble, suddenly is worth a lot more than this family ever thought it would own. Uh, this is an inclusive society. The number of Chinese families that own a home is twice the number of Indian families that have access to a toilet. Democracy is not a guarantee of inclusiveness. Um, where does this all leave us? Well, they've got some really serious political problems, but it's not going to lead to some kind of great revolution. There's a very solid system. One of the things that I haven't mentioned is the, the meritocratic, relatively meritocratic, uh, uh, governance system that they have created. Now, there's a whole political science literature in the West about how it's not a meritocracy at all. And I'll have to leave you to read the book for the analysis of where that went wrong. Um, but 
they have built very solidly, as Taiwan did, as Singapore did, as South Korea did. Um, what does the future look like? Well, China's economy is far more open and competitive than Japan's, and they're going to get benefits from that. But growth has been declining for years. Uh, it will continue to decline. Uh, it's a lot less than the official statistics show. One of the things that's happened uh, under this administration in China is that the, the statistics uh, system has been corrupted. Uh, growth is achieved by borrowing money and putting it into relatively unproductive state enterprises. So there's no productivity growth. Uh, the, the result is that over a long, long run, uh, growth will suffer, and it will suffer severely. Uh, when the big companies in Japan got control of politics and the economy, uh, Japan went into stagnation. And uh, that's the risk for China. Uh, this, is, this is the risk that Xi Jinping was hired to avoid. And it's the, but it's the logical outcome of the policies he is pursuing. On the political side, in addition to having to cope with this problem of complexity, there's a very serious long-term problem that's not remarked at all, as far as I can tell, in the Western commentary. I began by talking about how Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji took these tremendous risks to be a vanguard party. Whenever they had a choice between what was good for the society and what was good for their direct political control, they chose growth. What would the counterparts of that be today? It would be step back from direct control of the state enterprises. Step back from party control of the judicial system. The economic benefits of that would be substantial. But today the priority is every aspect of political control we grab. This is the transformation of the Chinese Communist Party from a vanguard party to an interest group. And it will take a long time to have consequences, but this will gradually seep into people's consciousness. And this is a much more serious uh, threat in the long run than than the corruption and the things that, that uh, our commentary mostly talks about. What, what do we predict for the future? Well, resistance to policies that undermine China's growth and its political le legitimacy are, are gathering force. You can't see it, it's invisible. But it's there. Nobody speaks out because everybody's afraid. The China today reminds me of the high school chemistry. We, we, we studied these supersaturated liquids. And you hold up the glass, and it's very clear water. And then you go tap, tap, and a lot of white stuff precipitates out. What's going to precipitate out in China? I don't know. I don't know. What I can tell you is things are either going to get a lot better or they're going to get a lot worse. Not going to remain the same. Uh, we have not seen the end of history for China. Let me stop there. Thanks very much. Uh, um, 
I didn't mention at the beginning that um, the book, China's Crisis of Success, really should be a must read. Um, I had the opportunity to read it uh, late last year, and uh, it's really, um, I, I, I still keep on thinking about it. Um, We've got some copies outside to pedal at a discount, by the way. It's definitely worth uh, <laughs> your, uh, um, it, and, and it's, um, I think it's what, the, uh, the, Arthur, the author discount plus uh, um, shipping. Cost. Shipping, so. <laughs> um, so I'm going to open up the, um, the floor for questions in just a moment, but I wanted to um, uh, ask one or two um, if I could. Um, you know, one of the ways in which I've been thinking about um, kind of what uh, Xi Jinping is up against, I, I, I'm thinking about it comparatively um, uh, with what Deng Xiaoping was uh, kind of confronted with at the, uh, the, the end of the 1970s. And it seemed to me that Deng had a lot of resistance in, uh, in Beijing uh, among a number of entrenched interests, but he had a lot of potential support uh, locally in China. Um, and so I don't want to minimize what he was up against, but he really did seem to have, uh, to harness a kind of a, a, a set of interests that, uh, that helped kind of put the wind um, to his back uh, once things got started. It seems to me that she has you know, the opposite problem, right? Or not the opposite problem, but, uh, but not only does he have people at the center that he's kind of working against, but he's also got all these interests at the local level, a situation that's, uh, seems to me f uh, far more daunting than, than, than what Dung had to, to, to deal with in, in, in certain ways. And in the spirit of that, you, you had mentioned that um, kind of the worst squeeze is on local governments. And as somebody who's interested in local governance myself, I was wondering if you, uh, if you wouldn't mind just, just, uh, just expanding a little bit on, on, on what that means and whether or not uh, this, this comparison with Dung is an apt one or not. Yeah, I, I think local party people in Deng's time didn't want to lose their power. So uh, I think the, your phrase, when it got going, is the right phase. Once it got going, uh, the farmers were, you know, their incomes went up by a factor of six in a fairly short period of time. Once it, once it got going, it had tremendous support. Um, we did a study on the current squeeze on local governments. We did a study of the city of Foshan. It's a very successful city just north of Hong Kong. Uh, when we were studying it a few years ago, per capita income was about $15,000, uh, so much higher than the rest of China. What Foshan was paying in interest and principal on its debt was about 110% of tax and fee revenue. Uh, so, suggests a problem. But they were, sell, they would get land from the peasants and sell the land and uh, they were paying their bills uh, very successfully. So what happens under reform? Under reform, you're not supposed to take so much land from the peasants, so your revenues go down. Interest rates are freed so that debt service and interest plus principal of 110% goes up. And, and you're being told you have to provide social services, education, medical insurance, pensions, not just to the local uh, folks, but also to the rural immigrants who are half of the, your population. So all your social costs are going to double. So your income goes down, your costs go through the roof. If you're the local mayor, or the local party secretary, I think those guys are, in Beijing are trying to kill me. Plus, plus, as they try to deleverage the Chinese economy as a whole, uh, they're saying you can't be nearly as innovative in your financing as you've been in the past. Uh, so shadow banking, for instance, has been uh, truncated quite a lot. And so uh, pushback is very serious. 
So let me um, ask one more question, then I'll open up the, the, the floor uh, more broadly. I, in, in your book, you only uh, briefly mentioned BRI, and today you didn't mention, um, you, you focused on the domestic altogether. And I'm just wondering, to what degree might what China's doing internationally work to either exacerbate or uh, relieve pressure on the, the, the types of um, uh, phenomena, so, uh, economic and political phenomena that, and social phenomena that, you're, that you've been talking about? Well, uh, the good news for BRI is they're, they're finding stuff for the big state enterprises to do, building roads in Africa. And, uh, uh, it's very good for these countries. Uh, Deborah Brodigan of, of, of SICE has done a lot of good work on that. Um, the bad news is that while they say this, this is a commercial uh, thing, it's not the Marshall Plan. Uh, they're committing something between 48 billion and 60 billion to Pakistan. Now, I worked for investment banks for 21 years. Anyone who can find even $48 billion of creditworthy projects in Pakistan is a lot smarter than any <laughs> investment banker I've ever known. So at one level, it's a Marshall Plan that outmarshals the Marshall Plan uh, in terms of the, the costs. Uh, and some of these things, I don't buy the idea that they're kind of deliberately getting countries too indebted so they can take over stuff. But it's happening as these predatory state enterprises do their own thing. Uh, and so you, you get stuff like the, the port in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, eventually, these, these countries are going to bite back. They're going to say, oh, you got that deal because of bribery. Uh, it's not legal. You don't get our port for 99 years. And so I, I th and the way they're doing it is not going to be as commercially successful, even on the really commercial projects, as they hope. Uh, for instance, they go to Indonesia, get a deal to build a power plant, and they provide backward technology, in this case, actual machinery that didn't work in China. So they thought, uh, we'll give this to Indonesia and charge them a lot of money. And they require a state guarantee from Indonesia. And the Japanese come along and say, well, We'll give you good technology, the best, the latest technology. And it'll work. You know it'll work because we've got a track record. And we won't require a state guarantee. So that if it doesn't make a profit, you don't have to give up your port or whatever. And the Japanese consistently win. Uh, this is very good for these countries on balance. It's very good. It's creating a competitive dynamic that will get the, good, the Indonesians good power plants. Uh, but it's, it, it's a great vision. It's exactly the Bretton Woods vision that the US created after World War II. Uh, you create this vast network of development with a, a development bank that funds infrastructure and some institutions that create common standards. And it's got Chinese characteristics, but this, uh, this is like, you know, a, a Mozart variation on an earlier theme. It's not, this is not a revolutionary undermining of the system. Uh, but the vision, the vision so far isn't being implemented very well. Uh, they're they're going to have to fix a lot of things before it's net positive for China. Yeah. Uh, 
And please introduce uh, yourself. Uh, hi. Uh, hi, thank you, Professor. I'm Yu Fan, second year China studies here. Um, I agree with everything you said. Um, but uh, my question is, is also about, because I, it seems that you talk a lot about Chinese domestic politics, uh, about factions, and, and um, so my question is, is that, you know, to us, to Chinese people, it seems that Xi Jinping tried to achieve a lot of things at the same time. And it seems that, um, you know, he scrapped the term limit. It seems to me that he, he, he wants to achieve something. He wants to leave a legacy. Um, what do you think that would be and whether he can achieve it? Um, that's a very important question. I don't think his domestic economic and political legacy is going to be very much. I think it's going to look like Hu Jintao's legacy. Uh, and so I'm a little concerned that he may, might uh, look for a, a big foreign policy legacy. Uh, um, Taiwan is one possibility. Now, a big fight over Taiwan would really collapse Chinese finances, so that'd be a really bad, a really bad idea. But he, as you say, he is very concerned about the legacy, and it's not working. So uh, this is something, this is a question we should all be asking <laughs> every few months. <laughs> what, what does Xi Jinping really have in mind for his legacy? Hi, I'm Gary Tellerico. I'm an adjunct professor here. I teach a course on the financial systems of Japan and China. And like you, I spent 20 years in investment banking. Um, as I look at what's going on in China right now, I see a lot of parallels to Japan, particularly in terms of economic bubbles that are developing, not just in real estate, but a debt bubble that's quite daunting. And I just wonder whether, given the fact that reform has been kind of put on hold and control is being emphasized over control, over uh, reform, whether China's heading in the same direction. Because if you remember during the last decade, the Japanese hid all their problems and repressed um, information from the public, et cetera. Is it going to be a financial crisis that could change government here again? Another very, very important question. I, China does have some of the same problems, but I don't think the outcome is going to be a Japanese-style uh, uh, banking and, and uh, uh, property and stock market collapse. Um, some fundamental differences. Uh, China's debt is high, but they've got a very high savings rate. And uh, it, they have a long, long way to go before their total debt is, is comparable to Japan today. So we, we know a country can carry a lot more. A country with such a huge savings rate can carry a lot more debt than China has. It does have a real estate bubble. Uh, but... In Japan, the banks were way, way overexposed. People were taking out third-generation mortgages. Uh, so they, they were mortgaging their, their, to their grandchildren. Uh, in China, uh, people put down at least 30%. And a large proportion put down cash to buy these, this property. So if property market plateaus or go d goes down a bit, uh, and I don't think it'll go down 50% the way uh, it has in, in periodically in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, that will cause problems, but it won't, it won't take down the banking system the way, the way property took down the Japanese banking system. Uh, likewise, the stock market. The stock market's a pretty small proportion of people's 
uh, total assets. In Japan, it was much bigger. Uh, like Japan, it's all in local money, almost all in local money. So I, I think what we're going to see is, is a kind of sand in the gears. Uh, uh, the problem is that the money is not being invested productively. And, and so the, the potential growth of the economy is going to go down, down, down. Uh, and I, I think that will, that will be disturbing politically. The, the legitimacy, comes, le legitimacy comes from growth, and it comes from the sense of uh, the Communist Party as a vanguard party that's really going all out for the people. And those, those two things are just gradually eroding. Uh, I, I think it was, it's a long-term process. It's not a sharp break. Uh, gentlemen, the um, front row. I'm a Peter Humphrey, intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Um, I think the unchallenged conquest of the South China Sea is a pretty good legacy. So even if he gets nothing else, he gets props for that. Um, what, I, what I find really interesting is when we look at the long-term analysis, there's just nothing about China's rise that is in the interest of anything but China, uh, arguably the world's most selfish country. And so, given that, I'm wondering where the mindset uh, is now compared to our look at the Soviet regime in the 50s. Because at somewhere around the 60s, we decided this isn't in anybody's interest but the Soviets, and we're going to begin a long-term, ultimately, two-generation campaign to degrade and crack the Communist Party, um, and ultimately is successful. Um, Given what we see for China, uh, why doesn't that subject come up, particularly given that it's not necessarily a military challenge the way it was with the Soviets, but a challenge merely of breaking the Great Firewall? I mean, that's really all you have to do. And yet, there's nothing. You hear crickets when that concept comes up. Um, I'm glad you asked that question, because I couldn't disagree more. The idea that only China has benefited, we have benefited enormously, even, in, even just in the most direct uh, economic way. Uh, a decade or so ago, there was a study that was never published that uh, was done by one of our big car companies working with, with a, a government agency. And, the conclusion was that the bottom 20% of our population was 7% better off because of what they could buy at Walmart more cheaply. But don't you, don't you feel that at some point the Muslim countries stop their silence and say, no more. You don't get to lock up a million of our people. It's uh, over, and that's the, that, end of, that's the end of Belt and Road. Any, any Muslim country is going to stand up and say, sorry, guys, I, I let our people go, or it's over. I think it's, uh, I think there's an important point that you make, but I think, I think it's a little more nuanced than that. Uh, the, the benefits of, of building the infrastructure through Kazakhstan and Uz, uh, Uzbekistan and all these places and uh, getting the economies going is, is enormous. And, and these governments have a very hard time balancing, by and large, the governments uh, give China a buy on, on Xinjiang. Uh, and it's a terrible thing that they're doing. Uh, uh, the, 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 but they're getting demonstrations of the people in these countries saying, you know, our government's got to stop tolerating this. Um, but the security benefits we get from collaboration with China are overwhelming. Um, you know, you go back to the founding of 
Bangladesh in 1970. Uh, and everybody knew this was going to be a total disaster. Bangladesh should be a giant jungle Somalia of 90 million people spewing terrorism all over the world. Now, what's happened? The textile industry has slopped over from China to Bangladesh. Bangladesh is now the second largest producer of textiles and garments. And the industry moved from China, but most of the, the overwhelming portion of the investment is actually American investment. So this is a Chinese-American collaboration that saved the world from one of the, the biggest terrorism problems we could possibly imagine. And this is spreading because of the Belt and Road type stuff, but more fundamentally just because of the, the Sino-American collaboration that's going on. When I worked with Ethiopia, there were six Leninist parties killing each other. It was very violent. They had one of the worst famines in the world. What's been the fastest growing country in the world recently? Ethiopia. Mostly Chinese investment. That is saving us from a huge terrorism problem. If we, if we and the Chinese would get together more on this, we would have many fewer Syrias and Iraqs to deal with than, than, than we have. And, and if we allow this to break down, it's a, it's a national security catastrophe for us. I've got a book coming out next month on the North Korean situation. The North Korean situation is potentially solvable because we and the Chinese work together so well on this. I repeat that, we and the Chinese work together so well. On this. this is the greatest threat of nuclear war we have in the world today. The Indians and Pakistanis are creating a, a, a competing one, but, but North Korea is still the worst. And we and the Chinese together have a an increasingly good handle on this the situation in North Korea. Uh, so the, and, and this is so much more important than the South China Sea. I mean, there's no comparison. It's a bunch of rocks. Bangladesh by itself is at least an order of magnitude more important than the South China Sea. And one of the things that's happened in Washington on a bipartisan basis is we've developed a complete in inability to see the positive aspects. The negative aspects are very important. What the Chinese have done in the South China Sea is very destructive. What they've done on intellectual property is wrong, and we have to confront, we have to confront them about it. But the positive aspects are so much bigger. And, and we're going to have a problem if we as a country don't come back to technocratic calculation of the balance sheet. Here are the positives, here are the negatives. Let's look at both, deal with the negatives, accentuate the positives. I think we've got uh, time for, uh, for one more. Um, Thank you, Professor, for your wonderful lecture. I'm a first year China study concentrator here at SAIS. Um, I'm getting a little bit confused here about what, ha what, I, have, what I have observed in China um, in, past, in, in the past year. It seems to me that in the past few years, the propaganda about deepening the reform in China has been increasing dramatically. Last year marked the 40th anniversary of the Chinese opening up a reform policy, and a lot of things happened. Uh, last year in Hainan, a lot of promises were made about uh, pushing forward the reform in the financial sector. And later in Shanghai, the Shanghai Import Expo was held. And there was this famous fancy expression from the CCTV commentator that the CCP is trying to um, use, for, use further reform to commemorate the reform. And um, so were you trying to say that 
the current administration is trying to pick up political st stability over economic interest, I would try to say that they are not very generally or sincerely want, uh, uh, trying to op uh, deepen the reform, or do you think they just lack the, they simply lack the ability to do so due to other uh, problems at home? Yeah. Uh, the rhetoric about reform and opening has escalated, but the, the implementation of reform and opening has de-escalated. Uh, I would say that this difference between rhetoric and reality is something that Beijing and Washington, D.C. share. <laughs> well, I can't think of a better note on which to end. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Please join me in uh, thanking William for